Good morning, and welcome to Church on the Rock, guys. We're, we're, we're very happy that you have decided to join us this morning, and, uh, and I'm super excited about uh, the things that the Lord is sharing, and, and, and I'm just pumped. I'm pumped to be able to go through some of this stuff with you guys. And uh, so with that being said, let's go ahead and pray before we get started. Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to convey your heart and what it is that you are wanting to say to us as your sons and daughters. And Heavenly Father, I ask that you would, you would anoint the words that are spoken this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would magnify your voice. And Lord, I ask that you would, you would make this word uh, uh, custom-tailored to fit each and every one of us, Heavenly Father, exactly where we are in our walk with you. Lord, we ask that you would help these things to stick, that we would make them applicable wherever they can be applied. And Heavenly Father, I ask that you would anoint the ears of my brothers and sisters, anoint the ears of those that are hearing your words, Heavenly Father. And we just ask that you would help us to bring you honor and glory in all that we do, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, again, I just, we, I invite you into this message, Heavenly Father. And I just ask that you would do what you do. <laughs> do what only you can do. All right, so uh, over the last couple of weeks, man, over the last year, this has been a wild year, guys, uh, as far as what's going on uh, on, on the world stage and, and locally and, and in the church, uh, you know, just everything that's going on. This is a pretty exciting time uh, to, to, to be alive and to be walking with the Lord. And, you know, um, we've been talking about pretty consistently about uh uh, Kairos and Kronos moment, you know, a chronological timeline and, and, and a divine moment that the Lord has set to intervene, a uh, prime ripe moment. And, and we had been going through everything from, from Passover to the death, burial, and resurrection, you know, to, to Pentecost. And, and, and it seems like that we're kind of going through this timeline of experiencing the Bible. And with, with that being said, uh, what we had been talking about, you know, Pentecost was a few weeks ago. And then what happened after Pentecost was... Uh, was they became they became the the disciples became endowed with power and the first thing that happened was was Peter actually began preaching the good news and and of the good news there was three thousand it says there were three thousand men that were added uh, to the kingdom there were three thousand men that that were saved and and that isn't including the the women or the children the wives and the families and so that's a pretty significant number and uh and. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had talked about, you know, developing the good news. Well, the good news has already been developed, but how we can articulate that in our own uh, verbiage to share the good news with our with our loved ones, with our family members, with our friends, with our co-workers, uh, with, with all areas, every area of our influence that we could share the good news. And, and then Rod had an amazing message last week. Uh, which was, the title was hilarious. It was the bad news about the good news. It really made me chuckle. And, uh, and I'm telling you, that was, that was a powerful message. And, and it, it, it talked about, you know, this is the good news and this is what happens when we, when we don't receive the good news or if the good news is rejected. And so, um, you know, I, I believe that in this particular uh, timeline, in this experiential timeline that we are actually uh, walking in right now of, of a chronological timeline and a Kairos time, you know, uh, a specified time that, that the Lord is going to, or that the Lord actually already is manifesting His presence presence and he is intervening in the way things in the way that things were going and um and he is he is operating out of his sovereignty to to, to help us to come into alignment with, with what it is that he's doing and so after uh after preaching the good news where we are in this sequ the sequential timeline is is after the good news is preached uh, there's an opportunity for discipleship. There's an opportunity to become a disciple of Christ, become a disciple of Jesus. And that is actually what we're going to talk about today. So 
you know, after the good news has been preached to us, after we share the good news with our friends, family, or loved ones, and, um, you know, it, it's only up to us to share the good news, and it's up to them to either receive the good news or reject the good news. And so we just ask, Lord, that you would soften all of the hearts that we get to share the good news with, Heavenly Father, and draw man unto yourself. And Lord, we're just asking for salvation of humanity in the mighty name of Jesus. So, what I want to talk with you guys about this morning is, uh, is what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple? And so I got this uh, thing kind of prepared in three little sections. Uh, the first one is what does it mean to be a disciple? The second one, the second section is a disciple's attitude towards sin. And the last section is the greatest motivation. And so uh, I'm thankful that the Lord has, has shared this with me. Um, it was quite humbling the way he had shared it with me. Um, I, I had to, I've had an amazing week with the Lord and, and really had to go through some repentance of pride, uh, you know, and asking the Lord to bestow uh, humility to me and, and, and ask the Lord to help me to walk in humility. You know, his word says that he sets himself up against the proud, but he exalts the humble. And so guys, we really want to be humble and walking with the Lord. And uh, so I asked the Lord to share with me uh, what's on his heart and what he wants to share with his, uh, with his sons and daughters. And this is what he shared with me. So I'm going to do my best to get through this uh, in a timely fashion, and also I'm pretty excited about this. This is is a uh, it's a new Bible that I've been working with. It's a it's a New King James Bible. Uh, it is a little bit different. It, it, it kind of like is it's kind of like having a new car. You know, it's like. It's so much more updated and so much more new and I'm still trying to figure out how to navigate it. Uh, it has these like little little tabs uh, that I have not yet mastered. So I find myself, I know where these books in the Bible are. I find myself stumbling through them trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to find, I know it's there, but it's just a little bit different than what I'm used to. Uh, so with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and talk about what does it mean to be uh, to be a disciple. And so the term disciple, um, originally it means, it means a pupil of a teacher or a apprentice to a master craftsman, a apprentice to a master craftsman. And see, many of us or many people believe, uh, that we've become disciples of Jesus when he has forgiven us of our sins. And according to Colossians uh, 2.13, it says, we were dead in our trespasses, yet through forgiveness, he has made us alive together with him. However, this forgiveness of sin does not necessarily mean we become, uh, we become apprentices to a master craftsman or even a pupil to a teacher. It is, what I'm saying is it is possible to experience forgiveness of sins and then to not actually become a disciple of Jesus. And that is what we're trying to stay away from. What we're trying to do is, is share the good news, uh, see salvations occur, and then create disciples, disciples to Jesus. And um, it says, once we have received atonement for our sin and are reconciled to God through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, only then do we get the opportunity, only then do we get the opportunity to follow the example set through the life of Jesus. So, uh, according to Jesus, uh, in Luke chapter 6, verses 40, it says that it is a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So, a disciple of Jesus enters a lifelong learning process to live a life like Jesus lived his life. That's what it is to actually become a disciple. It is to be a pupil of a teacher. It is to be an apprentice to a master craftsman. And Jesus himself was the master craftsman. And we are to be the apprentice and follow his example of how he lived his life. So the life of Jesus is the, it's the perfect expression of of God's will. Uh, Jesus never sinned, uh, and this wasn't because he was born with a divine nature that can't be tempted. For Hebrews uh, 4.15 says, Hebrews 4.15 says that, uh, 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but he in all points was tempted as we are, but yet without sin. So see, throughout Jesus' life, he personally went through a training process to do God's will instead of his own. He, purposed, he, he, he went through a training process of learning how to do God's will and not his own. And, and, and those, these are things that we are in. These are things for, for those of us that have re received salvation, uh, you know, have recognized Jesus' atonement for our sins and the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, we get the opportunity to, to become disciples of Jesus. We get the opportunity to go through this training process of learning to do not my will, Father, but your will be done. And so uh, we who desire to be disciples or, or a apprentice to the master craftsman Jesus, we must do the same. So uh, guys, if you can turn with me to Philippians. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. Here we go. Uh, I just ask that you guys would have grace for me. As I stumble through this, uh, I just haven't quite figured out these tabs. On each one of these tabs, it says there's like three or four books. And so I go to the tab, and it's like, it's not there. And I'm like, what is going on here? And then I have to keep on, keep on, keep on turning. But in my head, I know where, I know right where Philippians is. It's, it's right after Ephesians. But for some reason, going through this, going through this new Bible, it's, it's tripping me up a little bit. So please have grace for me. Um, and, and, and again, let's go to, to the word of the Lord in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 uh, through 8 says, again, this is in the New King James Version. If you guys could follow along with me, if you got your Bibles, please flip them open. Um, or if you don't, you can take notes, but I'm going to go ahead and read you, the, read you the passage here. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 5 through 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus had to learn to discern God's will, and he had to learn obedience. He had to learn obedience. And, and, and what's funny in this particular scripture right here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So, so however Jesus uh, uh, acted, however Jesus uh, represented the Father, you know, however Jesus had relationship to the Father, we need to take that mind also upon ourselves. It reminds me of the scripture, it says, Romans 12, 2, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm paraphrasing here, it says, then you will know the acceptable will of the Lord. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Okay, so I got to renew my mind, and this is telling us what we need to remind, what we need to renew our mind to. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. And what that is, is humility. He took the form of a bond servant, not to be served, but to serve. Therefore, we should operate in the same humility. We're not looking for people to serve us. We are looking to serve individuals. So, who uh, turn with me to Hebrews Hebrews chapter 5, uh, we're going to read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. Oh, this, this magnificent new car. <laughs> Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. It says, this says, Who in the days of his flesh, it's talking about Jesus here, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, that would be God, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, this is something that the Lord, I've read this scripture a hundred times, this is something the Lord has just revealed to me. And what he has revealed to me is this is how to find out the will of the Father. It says, I, I wrote down right here, Jesus had to learn to discern God's will. 
and he had to learn obedience. So how do you discern God's will? Well, it says right here that in the in in verse 7 it says who in the days of his flesh. Well, so when Jesus was alive here on the earth, he offered up his prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And so what it's saying right here is through Jesus' prayers and supplications, he was able to discern the will of the Father. And so if, if Jesus had to learn to discern God's will through prayer, then we should probably do that too if we are to be disciples of Jesus. If we are to follow his example and this is what he did, then this is something that we should also do. And and, and the, the second, or actually the third part of verse seven, it says, it says, he was heard because of his godly fear. It was because he feared the Lord that the Lord was listening to his prayers. And, and does it not say in Proverbs that it says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so we had need to have a reverent fear of God. He is not only our Father, He's not only our provider, not only our protector, but He is the Almighty. He is the sovereign Almighty. And, 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 and he, he, he deserves our reverent fear of, of the things that He has done, of the things that He can do, and the things that He will do. Our reverence or, or fear of God is an absolute must um, for, for, for him to hear our prayers according to the scripture right here in uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7. Um, and so with, with, with that being said, uh, throughout Jesus' entire life, he learned the Father's will through prayer and then he exp he did the Father's will also. And, and this, is, this might just be for me, but it says here in verse 8, it says, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Now, now I wish that I didn't have to learn obedience by the things that I suffered, but unfortunately, it seems I have the opportunity to learn through two avenues, and that's either either uh, either obedience, <laughs> either 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 revelation, revelation. I learn through revelation, or I learn through. Uh, discipline. <laughs> discipline. It's revelation or persecution is what I was looking for. I, I can experience the revelation from God that, that he gives me through prayer, or I can suffer, I can suffer here persecution uh, and learn how to be obedient to the will of the Father. The choice is yours or the choice is mine. Persecution <laughs> or, or revelation. Again, the choice is mine. So, uh, Luke, Luke twenty two forty two, Luke twenty two forty two. 42, it says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, this is Jesus here. This is Jesus. He is about to go into a part of suffering that he wants no part of. But nonetheless, he is obedient. He is obedient. He says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. See, Jesus chose to humble himself and suffer in the flesh, denying his self-will and denying the demands from sin in the flesh. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 1 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourself also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased to sin. Here we are again, guys. Here we are again. Uh, in, an, in another passage, it's telling us to arm ourselves with the same mind of Christ. Arm ourselves with the same mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ was, was, was the mind of humbleness. It was the mind of humility. It was, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. It says, as a result, now this is, this is my commentary here, as a result of his incredible faithfulness, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. He never fell out of purity, he never fell out of goodness, and he never fell out of love. The teacher or the master craftsman is the example that we are to follow. So Jesus, he committed no sin, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. And this comes out of 1 Peter 
1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, it says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So it was a little bit of my commentary, but then I gave you the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, it says, For to this you were called, that's you. That's you, that's me. We were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. This says that Christ was the example for us that we should follow in his steps. We should follow the example of Christ. We should be the disciples. We should be the pupil of the teacher. We should be the apprentice to the master craftsman. That is what it is to be a disciple of Jesus, is to follow his example. In 22, it says, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. He was sin-free, and he did not have deceit. No deceit came out of his mouth. There was no ulterior motive. There was no hidden behind the scenes. What he spoke in the life he lived was the example that we are to live by. And so, do you mean to tell me that we're supposed to follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Absolutely. You mean Jesus committed no sin, so I'm supposed to not commit sin? Hmm. That's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. He had no deceit in his mouth. Therefore, I should not be lying. I should not try. I should not be trying to deceive my friends, my family, uh, to manipulate and, and, and get my will to be done out of the matter. Huh. Wow. You know, in, in these conversations that I've had with myself, I've also had friends, family, and brothers and sisters say, it's impossible to stop sinning. And in Matthew 19, 26, it says, Hey, with God, all things are possible. What do you mean it's impossible to stop sinning? If Jesus, <laughs> if Jesus died for our sins and we are a new creation in Christ, then I have the opportunity to live a life now, since I'm a new creation, sin-free, sinless, as the example of Christ. I'm to follow his example and to live a sin-free lifestyle, you know? Um... And, and, then, and then people have also used this argue, argument against me out of Romans 3.23. It says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glorious standard of God. And my rebuttal to that is it's absolutely right. For all have sinned. However, that is sinned past tense. That's S-I-N-N-E-D. Past. Past. All ha have sinned. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that we have to continue in sin. And it says, all have sinned, and I've recognized my sin, and I, I've pled the blood of Jesus. Uh, I've, I've confessed with my mouth and believed that my heart that Jesus Christ has died for my sins. Therefore, I am saved. Therefore, I am saved. <laughs> oh, that's right. All have sinned, but that doesn't mean we have to continue in sin. Like I said just a moment ago, we're new creations in Christ. In, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, a new creation in Christ. Well, brother, no one can live sin free, but we will die. Or nobody can. I've, I've heard people say nobody can live sin free. And they say, but when we die, we'll be sin free. And that poses a question that I want to pose to you. If we can only live sin free lives after death, does that not make death our Savior as opposed to Jesus? If I can only be free from sin when I die, then I would look forward to death in order to be sin-free. That makes death my Savior, not Jesus. Just think about it. Think about it. But Jesus died for my sins so that I could live a sin-free lifestyle, so that I can be a disciple of Christ, so that I can be a disciple, a son to the Almighty, to God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for that opportunity. So the way, uh, the way that Jesus walked, the way that Jesus uh, communed with the Father, the way that Jesus uh, functioned uh, in operating and discerning the will of the Father is he, he, he walked in a lifestyle of prayer. Um, many times in the scripture, I recognize many times in the scripture, it says Jesus got up before they was awake and he went away and, and spent time with the Lord in prayer. Um, <laughs> oh man, the way that Jesus walked was a hidden life of prayer with God the Father. 
where a work was taking place in his human nature, his flesh. And in this way, he overcame sin in the flesh and fulfilled God's plan of salvation for mankind. Turn with me to Romans. Romans chapter 8. <laughs> Every time I flip this Bible, I chuckle. Because I know, you know what I mean? I know right where I want to go, but it doesn't, it doesn't put me right where I want to go. Like I'm stumbling through Acts, knowing that Romans is right after Acts, but for some reason I can't get to Romans. So, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4 say, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might fulfill in us who do not work according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, because Jesus took upon himself human nature and the work of condemning sin as a human, then his disciples, which would be us who have the same nature, can follow him in this same way. And that is to <laughs> not be after the carnal mind, but be after the things of the Spirit. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, turn with me, guys, uh, to Hebrews uh, chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. Oh. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. Uh, out, of the, out of the new King James Version, it says, For it was fitting for him for whom all things are... Oh, start over. Excuse me. For it was fitting for him for whom all... Oh my gosh, this is difficult to read for me to read <laughs> the New King James. For it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in, bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, this is Jesus here, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through the death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. 15. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make prop propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Guys, excuse me for that difficult reading. <laughs> the, the New King James is uh, like speaking Spanish for me. But what this says right here is, first of all, we are brothers to Jesus. We are brothers to him. And that not only are we brothers to him, that the Lord has given us as children to him. And for those of you that have children, what do you do? You're, you're essentially discipling these little human beings into what they should become. And, and Jesus is discipling us into what we should become. He is the example on which we are to follow. And he became just like us so that he could so that he could obtain mercy on our behalf. He became just like us. It says that, that he does not help the angels, but he does help the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham is us, guys. Jesus is there to help us. For he suffered and he was tempted 
in order that he could aid those of us that are being tempted. The, the, the word of the Lord says that we are never tempted a, we are never tempted without a way of escape. When temptation comes, the Lord always provides a way of escape. And for that, I am very, very, very grateful. So <laughs> that is what it means to, uh, to be a disciple. Uh, those are those. I, I hope that I did an okay job explaining what it is to be a disciple. That's part. That's just part one. Now we're moving on to part two, and it's uh, the disciples, a a disciples' attitude towards sin. So just as Jesus was committed to doing all of God's will, instead of giving into the lusts of sin, so must his disciples, and that would be you and me. Jesus had a radical attitude concerning sin, and, and I want to share this attitude of Jesus that we also, as disciples, are to take on. And it's in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. And I'll read it to you, um, Matthew chapter 5, 27 through 30, says... You have heard, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Now, guys, that's pretty wild. That's a pretty, pretty wild, uh, I would call that crazy attitude toward sin. That if Jesus had this kind of ridiculous attitude toward sin, then maybe us as disciples should have that same attitude. If your eye, he said, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Because it's better for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven uh, missing an eyeball than to perish in eternal hell. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cut it off, for it is better for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven missing a hand than for your entire body to be in hell. So if Jesus had this crazy attitude towards sin, then we should as well. <laughs> Remember, guys, in, in Philippians 2, 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. If this was the mind of Christ, and we are um, encouraged to have the same mind of Christ. And then also in 1 Peter 4 through 12, again, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. If Christ had this ridiculous attitude towards sin, then so should we. So should we. Sin is unacceptable. Unacceptable. No if, ands, or buts. Sin is unacceptable. Um, but, however, it is easier for, 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 for humanity, for humanity, it's easier to give in to sin than it is to deny ourselves. Now, I don't hear anybody arguing with me over that. It's easier to give in to the lusts of our flesh than it is to deny ourselves. And if we do give in to the sin, we usually, humanity usually tries to justify it. We try to make excuses. We even defend our actions. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Guys, let this not be. Let it not be like that. It, it, it is what it is. A lot of times when we do mess up, we do try to defend our actions and we try to justify and, 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 and make it seem right when actually there's no excuse for sin. Sin is a no-go. However, uh, if a mistake is made and we are genuinely uh, trying to be disciples of Christ, then... <laughs> As disciples of Christ, we have to learn that God's will for us is first to acknowledge the truth. And I have jotted down here John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. And paraphrasing here, it says, Men loved darkness rather than light. Humanity 
The reason we sin, guys, the cold hard facts is the reason that we sin is we love sin. I hate to say it, but it is what it is. It says right here, men loved darkness rather than light. It is difficult to submit to the will of the Lord. It is, but it is for our benefit and it is for his glory. So ultimately, it isn't even about us. It's about glorifying our Father. It's about doing His will. And so the first thing that we need to do is acknowledge the truth if a mistake is made. The second thing that we need to do, it's in James 4, 6, and it's humble ourselves. I'm going to turn there um, to James, James chapter 4. Uh, verses 6 through 10, I want to read it to you. So the first thing we do if there's if sin occurs is we have to acknowledge the truth. The second thing is we have to humble ourselves. Uh, James 4, uh, 6 through 10, it says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So I want to stop right there. When we, when we try to justify our actions or defend our actions or we try to make excuses for the sin that we have partaken in, and, and, and that is pride. That is pride. That is arrogance. When, when, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and we try to justify that, that is pride. And God sets himself against the proud. Now, I do not want the Lord to set himself against me in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I had to repent this week of pride and ask the Lord to help me to walk in humility because we can humble ourselves before the Lord or we can be humbled by the Lord. The choice is ours. And when we humble ourselves, guys, he gives grace to the humble to be able to go through and process and ask for forgiveness of sins and be restored and be redeemed into discipleship, be redeemed Huh, that's what the blood of Jesus is for. It's not that, it's not that we, <laughs> we can't be perfect. It's that if a mistake is made, we have, uh, we have somebody that's, that's, we have the blood of Jesus to, to, we can repent and we can ask the Lord to wash us with the blood of Jesus and make us white as snow. His word says that if we confess our sins to him, that he is true and just to cast our sins as far as the east to the west. I didn't even get through a couple of them, so we'll just start start from scratch. we got to humble ourselves. James 4, 6 through 10, it says, But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy be turned to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Guys, humility is where it's at. The, 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 the example of Jesus is humility. Humility. Humble yourselves. Lord, I ask that you would help us to humble ourselves. Help us to humble ourselves. Lord, we renounce pride. Lord, we command pride out of our beings in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. And we receive a spirit of humility, a spirit of humility where we can allow you to lead, where we can allow your will to be done through us in the mighty name of Jesus. Guys, and, and, and so the first part, if sin occurs, guys, is to one, acknowledge the truth, two, humble ourselves, and then three is in is in Matthew uh, chapter 7. I got Matthew chapter 7. And then what I wrote down here was to judge ourselves. And that's a difficult pill to swallow, guys. To judge ourselves. Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the key part, guys. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? <laughs> guys, we so all the time want to do the bait and switch. Don't look at how don't look at where I've sinned. Don't look at my shortcomings. Look over there at his. Look over there at hers. Don't, don't look at my fallacies. Look at somebody else's. Guys, and just let it not be. If sin occurs, we have to acknowledge that sin happened. Then we have to humble ourselves. And then we have to take responsibility for our actions instead of blaming something or someone else. 
Guys, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, to fulfill... Uh, to fulfill Jesus' words, we must love God's will so much that we give up our own will, or as Jesus put it, our own life, which is the inclination to sin that is inherent to our own human nature. Guys, it's all about picking up our cross and following Him. It's all about dying to ourselves daily. It's all about crucifying this flesh to allow Christ to live in us. It is, it is, we are inclined, our human nature is inclined and drawn to sin. However, when we die to ourselves continually and we are a new creation in Christ daily, we can conquer that, that human nature and we can live a lifestyle free of sin. <sighs> Turn with me guys to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I know it's a lot of scripture, but it's okay. Scripture is fantastic. <laughs> scripture is all scripture is used for the for the building up and and for the for the edification and for the correction of the saints. All of it. The scripture, man, the word of the Lord is so amazing. Guys, we just need to envelop ourselves in the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 14 verses 26 and 27. It says this is Jesus. The letters are in red. It says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Guys, that means business. Jesus means business. In order to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to love the Father. You have to love the Father's will more than your mom and dad, more than your wife, more than your children, more than your friends. You have to love Him more than anything to be considered a disciple. And, 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 and guys, I want you to weigh that. I want you to weigh that. Are you willing to put God first and foremost above everything else in your life? That is what it costs to be a disciple. In 27, it says, Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> we have to die to ourselves daily, continually spend time in prayer, focusing and figuring out the will of the Lord. He says in James 4, 2, You have not because you ask not. I say, if we ask the will of the Father, he will share his heart with us. <laughs> <clears throat> Man, guys, uh, so oh, without this crazy radical attitude, we will not overcome sin and we cannot be Jesus' disciples. They're, 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 <laughs> we have to take on his attitude towards sin and that it is unacceptable. Guys, turn with me to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <laughs> Guys, Jesus' joy was that he would have disciples who lived the same lifestyle of submission to the Father. That is the joy of Jesus. That is what Jesus wants. He wants us to live a lifestyle of complete total surrender, complete total submission, complete total humility to the will of the Father. <laughs> that we would come to the, the that we would come to the same divine nature and laying down our lives and allowing the Lord to flow through us, allowing and laying down our lives and walking in complete surrender, complete submission to the Father's will, we also partner with the divine nature of Christ. 
Jesus looked forward to having brothers who would be able to share all of his inheritance. That's what Jesus looks forward to. You and I coming into fullness, not a measure, but coming into fullness of living and experiencing the divine nature of Jesus. For we are all to share in his inheritance. Turn with me, guys, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, then we may also be glorified together. <laughs> Man, his word is so awesome. It cuts through the chase. It gets right to the point. That's so. I want to read it again. So guys, Jesus would give him great joy, and he looked forward to having brothers who would be able to experience the divine nature of himself and the Father. His prayer was that we would understand that we are one with him as he is one with the Father. And he wants nothing more than for us to experience the inheritance that the Father has given him. I'll read it to you again. In Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are his brothers. It says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, then we may also be glorified together with him. Guys, flip over to, to Romans 8, 29. It says, For he... For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. <laughs> and again, here it is. The Lord's just letting us know <laughs> that he wanted us to be conformed to the firstborn, which was Jesus. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 10 through 18. I read this to you guys once, and I, I want to read it to you again. <laughs> Hopefully this time I can get it better. The first time I stumbled through it pretty rough. It says, For it was fitting for him, for whom all things were created. <laughs> I'm going to start over. <laughs> I don't know why this trips me up. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I, here am I and the children whom God has given me. In as much then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. <laughs> Man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that our attitude towards sin must be the same as yours. Thank you, Lord, that you came in human form and you experienced the temptation of sin so that you can aid those of us that are being tempted by sin. Lord, we ask that you would give us the revelation and the insight, the boldness, the courage, and we thank you that you've already given us the ability to overcome sin through you. Guys, in the last... 
the last part of this three part was the greatest motivation. The greatest motivation for us to become disciples is love. That's the greatest that's the greatest motivation for us to become disciples of Jesus is love. 1 John 4:19 says we love him because he first loved us. He came into the world and he died for our sins because he loves us. And now as disciples, we will manifest the fruits of the Spirit by loving Him back. He gave love, we give love. We can only give the Father what He has already given us, guys. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And He died for all that those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Guys, we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him. We live for Jesus. We live for the Father. We live to glorify his name. Disciples will not and cannot be satisfied with a sluggish attitude to use the forgiveness of sins as an excuse to give in to the lusts of their sinful desires. Guys, I've seen it for too long. We use the forgiveness of sins as a crutch, as, as a crutch to do whatever we want. And guys, we gotta stop. We, we, we cannot let it be anymore. We cannot be satisfied with the sluggish attitude to use the forgiveness of sins as an excuse to continue to give in to the lust of our sinful desires. It has to stop. <laughs> the goal of Jesus set for us is simple. It's simple. It really is simple. The goal that Jesus set for us is in Matthew 5, 48, and it says this, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Again, I already hear you guys. That's impossible. And I'm telling you right now, all things are possible through God. His word says that we shall be perfect just as as our Father in heaven is perfect. And again, I say to you, you say that can only happen through death, and that is not true. That happens through life in Christ. <laughs> if that only happens through death, then we find salvation in death and not Jesus. Jesus came and he died so that we may live. And we can live and be perfect just as our Father is perfect. So soak on that for a little bit. Think about that. To be disciples of Jesus, there are sufferings necessary to the process of being transformed from a sinful man into the perfect image of Christ. But with Christ as our example and the love of Christ compelling us, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Let us pray, guys. <laughs> Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for this message, Heavenly Father. I thank you for this message of what it is to be a disciple. The attitude that we should have towards sin, Heavenly Father. And then even the greatest motivation, why we should be motivated to be your disciples, Lord. It's through your love. Lord, and I ask that you would take these words and I ask that you would allow them to penetrate deep into the hearts of my brothers and sisters. Lord, and I thank you that you will bring to completion, you will finish that good thing which you have started, and that is salvation. <laughs> that is for us to be disciples. That is for us to be perfect even as you are perfect. As your word says, Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would breathe your spirit. I ask that you would breathe life to these words. And as we go through our week, Heavenly Father, you would bring them back to our memory. Lord, help us to honor and glorify you. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you guys. I hope this blessed you. I hope this encouraged you. And I hope that you can continue going forth doing the will of our Father. Have a blessed week.